Hey, Carl, I'm doing a survey on my phone here. It's asking me a question. What fictional character am I most like? Obi-Wan Kenobi. I'll take that. Wise, powerful, courageous. Just the way he looks? I'll take that too. I like you, McGregor. You mean the old guy in the desert? Alec Guinness? What the f***? Hi, and welcome to this video in bioethics. Today, we're going to discuss euthanasia and physician-assisted dying. Yay! We'll begin with some terminology. Next, we'll look at some important cases that express why this issue has been so contentious in the United States. Finally, we'll develop some categories to differentiate between different types of euthanasia and physician-assisted dying. This should help you think more clearly about your own views on this controversial topic. Also, as a side note, today I'm going to focus less on moral arguments and more on legal precedents. You know, just to switch things up a bit. Let's get started. Euthanasia comes from the Greek word eu, which means good, and thanatos, which means death. Yes, Carl, the Marvel character who wanted to kill half of the entire universe's population was named after the Greek word for death. Pretty clever, right? Maybe I should remind you of that character. I'd like to kill half the people in this room. What? I didn't say anything. What? So, euthanasia tends to mean something along the lines of good death, or dying well. In modern usage, the term tends to refer to actions or inactions, taken with the specific intention of bringing about the death of another, typically to end or prevent their pain or suffering. Animal companions are often euthanized when they get sick or old, as are cats and dogs in shelters, and animals in experimental labs. However, our focus in this video is going to be human euthanasia. To be clear, that's not because I don't think the euthanasia of non-human animals isn't morally significant. I do. It's just because I want to have some focus for this video. I said that euthanasia can refer to actions or inactions. Another way of saying this is that euthanasia can be active or passive. Active euthanasia refers to someone taking action to end the life of another, for instance by injecting medication to hasten death. Passive euthanasia refers to someone ceasing, or not administering in the first place, life-sustaining medical care or treatment, and allowing that person to die. For instance, when a doctor ceases treatment for a patient with terminal cancer at the request of that patient. Physician-assisted dying, sometimes referred to as physician-assisted suicide, is potentially unique because it refers to an action taken by the patient themselves themselves to end their own life. For instance, taking a medication that hastens death. However, a medical practitioner prescribes the medication. So, a physician assists by providing the medication, but the patient administers the medication themselves. The concept of euthanasia isn't new. It was debated and practiced by some in ancient Rome. And the Hippocratic Oath, developed long before Jesus was around, addresses it directly. I will not hurt my fellow or put a knife to his flesh if I don't know how, or give him an herb to soothe his pain, even if he begs for it in anguish if it might take away his breath. This notion of taking away breath is interesting because it highlights an important topic. In our video on abortion, we talked about the significance of defining words like life and person. Here, it's important to have a working definition of the word death. The question of what constitutes death, that is, at what point is someone actually dead, is rather complicated, both philosophically and legally. For most of history, death was associated with the functioning of the lungs or the functioning of the heart. In the 1960s, a committee from the Harvard Medical School developed a criteria for death that focused on the loss of brain activity, including activity in the brain stem. This standard, which came to be known as total brain death, in conjunction with the circulatory and respiratory standard, is generally accepted in the United States under the Uniform Determination of Death Act, or UDDA, which was established in 1980. A person is dead if their circulatory or respiratory systems are irreversibly non-functioning, or their whole brain, including the brain stem, is irreversibly non-functioning. Now that we have some definitions under our belt, let's turn our focus to some cases. There are a number of cases that launched the issues of euthanasia and physician-assisted dying into public debate in the United States. Let's take a look at a few. First, the case of Karen Ann Quinlan. The year was 1975. Karen Quinlan was 21 years old. She was undergoing a diet. While out with some friends, she was drinking alcohol and took a drug. After going home, she became unconscious and stopped breathing. Though she was resuscitated, it was determined that a lack of oxygen to her brain left her in a persistent vegetative state, which means that her higher brain, the parts responsible for language, awareness, and consciousness, wasn't responsive to stimuli. In the hospital, Karen was placed on a nasogastric feeding tube, a tube inserted through the nose to deliver nutrition to the patient, and a respirator to keep her breathing. After much deliberation, the Quinlan family elected to have the respirator removed, which they and the hospital believed would result in Karen's death. And the hospital, in part directed by the ethical beliefs of Karen's doctor, declined to remove her from the respirator, citing concern that they might be liable for harm 
homicide. The parents took their request to have the respirator removed to court. Their request was denied by the Superior Court of Morristown, New Jersey, but that decision was later appealed and overturned by the State Superior Court of New Jersey, whose unanimous ruling held that the patient's decision to decline life-sustaining care, or remove life-sustaining care, carried more legal weight than the state's interest in keeping the patient alive. Obviously, Karen Quinlan couldn't make this decision for herself. The question was, could anybody make it for her? The state Supreme Court decided that the family, as opposed to the court or the hospital, was best positioned to make this decision on behalf of Karen. Karen's respirator was removed in May of 1976, about eight months after the family first filed the suit. Surprisingly, at least at the time, Karen started breathing on her own. In many cases, people in a persistent vegetative state don't require a respirator, since activities such as breathing are regulated by the brainstem, not the higher brain. They simply require artificial delivery of food and hydration because they can't eat on their own. The family didn't seek to remove Karen's feeding tube. To them, that seemed like an altogether different act than removing the respirator. And Karen Quinlan lived in a vegetative state for over nine years, until her respiratory failure on June 11, 1985. The case of Karen Quinlan wasn't argued before the United States Supreme Court, and state Supreme Courts don't set binding precedents for other states. Nevertheless, the case started an avalanche of changes in state laws and medical practices. Hospitals started forming ethics committees. Patients were advised to create advanced directives, legal documents stating what their decision would be if they ended up in a situation like Karen Quinlan. And state specified laws in terms of the immunity of physicians in terms of homicide in cases of the removal of life-sustaining care at the request of the patient. Second, the case of Nancy Cruzan. In 1983, Nancy Cruzan was in a car accident at the age of 25 in the state of Missouri. The accident left her in a persistent vegetative state. After their parents realized their daughter's condition was irreversible, they requested that the doctors remove her feeding tube, allowing her to die. The hospital required a court order before they would comply. However, the legal journey became quite complicated. In 1987, a county probate judge ruled that the parents could have the tube removed, but the state attorney general appealed the decision to the state Supreme Court. Court, and that court reversed the lower court's decision in 1988, citing lack of evidence for Nancy's wishes. The family then appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, which agreed to hear the case. In 1990, the Supreme Court ruled against Nancy's parents in a 5-4 decision because they didn't find sufficient evidence regarding Nancy's wishes. It's important to note that this decision did not mean disconnecting Nancy from the tube was illegal. It just meant that Missouri's law requiring evidence of Nancy's wishes wasn't unconstitutional. After the Supreme Court's ruling, Nancy's parents went back to the original county probate judge with new evidence of Nancy's wishes. The state withdrew its opposition, and Nancy's tube was removed on December 14, 1990. She died on December 26. The Cruzan case did not establish a constitutional right to die. It did, however, establish precedent that patients have a valid interest in declining or removing life-sustaining medical treatment. However, this interest must be weighed against the interest of the state in preserving the life of its citizens. In a sense, we're talking autonomy versus beneficence here. In cases where the wishes of the patient are unclear, for example because there's no advanced directive, the state's interest can outweigh the interest expressed by the family on behalf of the patient. But this is ultimately up for each state to decide. At any rate, the Cruzan case did a lot to increase attention for advanced directives. Third, the case of Elizabeth Bovia. Unlike Karen Quinlan and Nancy Murphy, Elizabeth Bovia was never in a persistent vegetative state, nor was she in an accident. She was born a quadriplegic because of cerebral palsy. She was mentally competent with a college degree, and she was married. But she had been abandoned by her family, including her husband, who left her after a miscarriage, and was financially destitute. She also developed severe degenerative arthritis, which left her in extreme pain. In 1983, when she was 26 years old, Bovia checked herself into the psychiatric ward of a California hospital because of her constant pain and need for care. She ultimately requested that the hospital allow her to starve herself to death while they keep her comfortable. The hospital refused. And when Elizabeth refused to eat, they force-fed her through a tube. When she bit through the tube, they held her down and forced a feeding tube through her nose. Backed by the American Civil Liberties Union, Elizabeth took her case to court. She argued that the forced feeding constituted assault and battery, but the court ruled against her, in part because they said the forced feeding could lead to her living for another 15 to 20 years, which they said is a good thing. She appealed that decision in 1986. The appellate court rejected the argument that the quantity of Bovia's years were all that mattered. It was also important to consider the quality of her years of life, and Bovia won the appeal. This meant that the hospital had to remove her feeding tube and care for her while she starved herself. However, in the interim between the cases, Bovia was placed on morphine for her pain. After winning her appeal, the combination of the side effects of the morphine and the pain of starving oneself to 
death. It's extremely painful and it takes about two weeks. Proved too great for her, and she wasn't able to go through with it. She continued to express her desire to die, describing herself as a reluctant survivor. She was alive as of 2008, 22 years after the appellate decision. Fourth, the case of Brittany Maynard. Brittany Maynard lived in California. She was happily married, with a bachelor's degree in psychology and a master's degree in education. In 2014, at the age of 29, Brittany was diagnosed with brain cancer. After surgery, which appeared initially successful, the cancer returned that same year, worse than before, and she was given six months to live. Brittany decided that she didn't want to die slowly and painfully from brain cancer, and so she sought other options. Unlike Karen Quinlan and Nancy Cruzan, she wasn't in a persistent vegetative state, and so she wasn't dependent upon a respirator or a feeding tube. Technically, she could have starved herself, but she was looking for a less painful solution. Brittany considered palliative care, a form of care that keeps someone comfortable as they die naturally, but ultimately she decided that she wanted a doctor to prescribe her with medication she could take on her own to hasten her death. This wasn't legal in the state of California, but it was in Oregon, so Brittany and her husband moved there. Her story became very public, in part because she wrote a compelling opinion piece for CNN entitled My Right to Die with Dignity at 29. Unlike the other cases we've discussed, this case wasn't about a patient's right to refuse life-sustaining treatment. It was about a patient's ability to secure life-ending treatment that they would administer themselves. Physician-assisted dying. Let's take a quick look at some background here. In 1990, Dr. Jack Kevorkian, who would later become known as Dr. Death, assisted in the suicide of Janet Atkins in Oregon. He built a machine, which he called Thanatron, man, people really like the Greek word for death, that would allow people to cause their own medically induced death with the push of a button. Kevorkian's work brought assisted suicide to the public's attention, not in small part because of his many court trials. He was acquitted on many accounts of assisted suicide, but eventually went to prison for second degree murder after filming one of the deaths and airing it on 60 Minutes. In 1994, Oregon, the state where Kevorkian first used his machine, became the first state to pass a law permitting physician-assisted dying under certain circumstances. The patient had to be terminally ill, that is, they had to have less than six months to live due to an illness, they had to demonstrate competency to choose this form of medical care, and they had to make their request for this care in writing. In the same year, Glucksburg v. Washington was being decided in Washington state. That case dealt with a law that banned physician-assisted suicide in that state. In in 1997, the United States Supreme Court made a ruling on this case that upheld Washington State's ban as constitutional. This meant that states had a constitutional right to ban physician-assisted dying, but it didn't mean that states couldn't make a law permitting it. Hence, Oregon's law wasn't in trouble. After moving to Oregon, Brittany took prescribed medication to end her life on November 1, 2014. Prior to Brittany's case, only three states had laws permitting physician-assisted dying. Montana had no law permitting it, but it did have a court precedent stating that it also had no law against it. Since Brittany's case, seven other states, including California, as well as the District of Columbia, have legalized physician-assisted dying. To be clear, there are countless other cases we could discuss, including cases from outside the U.S., where patients, even minors, who weren't terminally ill were administered life-ending drugs under euthanasia laws. But the four cases we've explored provide some foundation to discuss the moral and legal parameters of euthanasia and physician-assisted dying in the United States. Drawing on these cases and others, I'd like to end this video by categorizing various possible cases of euthanasia and physician-assisted dying, and highlighting the current legal status of these categories in the United States. You can find a link to my handy-dandy chart. What, people don't use the phrase handy-dandy anymore? I am Alec Guinness. In the description for this video, as already noted, euthanasia can be either active or passive. There's also physician-assisted dying. A few points for clarity here. Some people argue that passive euthanasia isn't euthanasia at all, since you're allowing someone to die by natural means rather than taking action to kill them. Second, some argue that in cases where you remove life-sustaining care, you actually are taking action to kill the person. And not only should these cases count as euthanasia, they should count as active euthanasia. Third, some, including the Roman Catholic Church, determine euthanasia based on whether the medical care is ordinary or extraordinary. Ordinary care is basic care that is not overly burdensome to the patient and has a high likelihood of success. Extraordinary care is overly burdensome to the patient, or even if it's not, it doesn't have a high likelihood of success. From the perspective of the Roman Catholic Church, people are morally obligated to seek ordinary care in all cases, but they are free to either accept or reject extraordinary care. But the Church also maintains, as was made clear by Pope John Paul II during the Terry Schiavo case, that feeding and hydration, even if it's by artificial means, is never extraordinary care, isn't medical treatment, and so can never count as extraordinary care. In other words, from that religious framework, 
homework is always morally obligatory. Finally, some sources conflate active euthanasia and physician-assisted dying, since both involve taking an action, whether by the self or by another, to hasten death. However, since the two are treated so differently in the United States in terms of law, I think it's helpful to keep them separated here. These qualifications aside, we have three general categories. Active euthanasia, passive euthanasia, and physician-assisted dying. But as our cases make clear, these categories can be further differentiated based on the mental state of the patients. Euthanasia can be voluntary, meaning the patient chooses it for themselves. It can be involuntary, meaning it's forced upon the patient against their will. It can also be non-voluntary, a term used to describe decisions made by others on behalf of a patient who can't make decisions for themselves. And I might add that euthanasia can be what I call post-voluntary, though to be clear, this is my own term which means it's done to a patient because of an advanced directive in which, at some point in the past, they express those wishes at that time. This gives us 12 potential scenarios, as you can see in this chart. Did you do it? Did you? Come on, man. I'm going to give a quick example of each scenario, with the exception of involuntary physician-assisted dying, which is impossible by definition, and discuss the legal status of those scenarios in the United States. In 2017, an elderly couple in the Netherlands, both of whom were declining in health, requested to be euthanized so that they could die together. Though such requests are rarely granted, in their case it was, and they died side by side on June 4 of the same year, after having been administered lethal drugs. This is an example of voluntary active euthanasia. Voluntary active euthanasia, as I'm defining it here, is illegal in the United States. The case of Elizabeth Bovia is an example of voluntary passive euthanasia, if you accept nutrition and hydration as a form of medical care. She wasn't asking to be killed, she was asking to be kept comfortable while she died. Voluntary passive euthanasia is legal in the United States, but it must be demonstrated that the patient is competent and therefore able to make an informed decision. This creates a potential issue for minors and people with particular disabilities. Brittany Maynard's case is an example of voluntary physician-assisted dying. In the US, this is a state's issue. The Supreme Court has established that states can mm -hmm. ban it, but states can also make it legal, at least in certain cases. For involuntary active euthanasia, we have to look at something like Nazi Germany. Though really, we can also look at plenty of things that have happened in American history as well. But Nazi doctors clearly euthanized people against their will. This is illegal in the United States. Involuntary passive euthanasia is more complicated. It seems like it should be illegal, but consider this question. Can a hospital deny or remove life-sustaining treatment if a patient can't pay for it. Hospitals can in fact deny certain types of care if patients can't pay for it or if their insurance refuses to cover that care. This actually happens more commonly than you might think, even when it involves life-sustaining care, if the insurance company deems that care to be experimental. There's also evidence that some medical practitioners may pressure patients or families to end life-sustaining care for various reasons, including futility, it's not going to help, and economics, they know they don't have the money to pay for it. In these cases, to the extent that the patient's desire for life-sustaining treatment is denied, or they feel coerced into foregoing or abandoning it, it might qualify as involuntary passive euthanasia, they're being denied life-saving treatment against their will. The legality of such practices in the US is complicated. It depends in part on how we define terms like euthanasia in the medical community and in the legal community. Non-voluntary active euthanasia would include cases where a patient is in a persistent vegetative state, but there's no advanced directive regarding what that patient wants, so a family member makes a decision on their behalf to have a medical practitioner administer lethal drugs to hasten their death. Like all forms of active euthanasia, this is illegal in the United States. To the extent that Karen Quinlan didn't have a clear advanced directive, she could be considered an example of non-voluntary passive euthanasia euthanasia. Her family made the decision on her behalf in a manner that they believed was consistent with her wishes. The legality of this practice fluctuates from state to state. For example, in the case of Nancy Cruzan, the Supreme Court upheld Missouri's requirement of evidence regarding Nancy's wishes. Hence, in some states, substantial evidence, or even an advanced directive, is required. And so non-voluntary passive euthanasia, at least as I'm defining it, would be illegal in those states. Non-voluntary physician-assisted dying is a strange concept but it might not be impossible. For example, if a medical practitioner convinced someone who lacked mental competency to take medication to end their own life, this might qualify. But we could question whether or not this would be physician-assisted dying or flat-out active euthanasia. Regardless, it would be illegal in the United States. In post-voluntary cases, the patient would have an advanced directive or at least substantial evidence regarding their wishes. For post-voluntary active euthanasia, the patient would be administered life-ending drugs per their directive. 
Again, this would be illegal in the United States. The case of Nancy would be an example of post-voluntary passive euthanasia. This is because, at the second trial, Nancy's parents produce sufficient evidence regarding Nancy's wishes. Provided they meet the legal requirements of the state they're in, advanced directives are binding. And so post-voluntary passive euthanasia is legal in the United States. Like non-voluntary physician-assisted dying, the notion of post-voluntary physician-assisted dying is odd. But again, it might be possible. Imagine a patient had dementia, and they developed an advanced directive that said, if I'm no longer competent, but I end up with a terminal disease, I want someone to give me lethal drugs that I can take on my own. I even want someone to convince me to take them, whether I'm competent or not. Again, the question here is whether or not this would constitute physician-assisted dying or a form of active euthanasia. At any rate, so far as I can tell, this would be illegal in the United States. In this video, we've explored some definitions pertinent to the topic of euthanasia. We've looked at some key cases in the United States. We've also categorized some various types of euthanasia and physician-assisted dying. I hope you found this information useful and interesting. Until next time, farewell.